for but they, they, see the, you gotta, Got a PowerPoint up there now you can see, guys. Yes, sir. A lot less echoey on here now. Well, turn your mic off if you're not uh, talking. Okay, we're going to get started here with distillation control. Um, big ILM, pretty interesting subject, I guess, if you're, you're into distillation. Um, a lot of information in here that we are kind of just going to uh, scan over or s skim over with the with the PowerPoint. There's a lot of uh, process operational descriptions that are in the ILM, and I would encourage you to you know make sure that you read through those and you kind of wrap your head around the, the basic idea of uh, of operations. Uh, there's a lot of different options and angles that we're going to look at here uh, in this ILM. Uh, we're just going to kind of touch on them. I'll leave the bulk of the reading for you guys to do. Um, there is about a half a dozen questions or so on the advanced process control exam that relate to distillation. I don't think that there is any math that you guys have to do, so it's mostly about uh, mostly about understanding the operations and the constructions and the methods uh, that are used to control distillation. So keep that in mind as as we go through the slideshow here. Okay, so learning objective one tells us that we are to define some terms that are related to distillation control. So distillation is the process in which components of a liquid mixture are separated through vaporization and condensation. So we heat them up and we collect the vapors. Vapor pressure is another term that uh, relates to the pressure that a gas exerts when a equilibrium with a solid or liquid in a closed container at a given temperature. And we've talked about vapor pressure in, in third year, and I always use the jerry can um, example. Uh, we've all experienced the jerry can example, I think, uh, and that's the best way to kind of visualize vapor pressure. Looking at a jerry can first thing in the morning, if you walked outside, uh, you'd probably see that your jerry can is caved in because the temperature is cooled and the uh, vapor pressure has went down compared to what it was probably the previous day when you put the lid on. If you leave the lid on and you leave that jerry can in the sun, as it heats up, the liquid inside the jerry can, the gasoline, will start to evaporate or vaporize. As it vaporizes, it builds pressure within the, the jerry can, and that pressure over top of the fluid is what we call the vapor pressure. Volatile is a term that we uh, associate with that vapor, and that just means that it's easy to evaporate. And when we're dealing with distillation, the idea is to take the, uh, the binary component that we're talking about in this ILM and trying to boil off the lighter material or the more volatile material and collect that because that's typically our higher value product, and then discard the bottoms or move the bottoms product to another process where we can get more out of it. Binary liquid is made up of two components and we exclusively talk about uh, binary distillation. We don't talk about uh, tertiary distillation or multi-component distillation, which is often called fractionation, but we don't worry about that. But know that we deal with binary liquids, which means that we're talking about two components. And for most of the examples in the ILM, it's uh, water and, and methanol. So that's what we run on our call them at the college there and you guys will get to experience most of the stuff in the lab and apply it into a practical application and it'll make a lot more sense uh, once you get to do that. Okay, vapor from a boiling mixture will contain a higher percentage of the more volatile component. 
Okay, so we talk about this vapor pressure and this equilibrium that we get between the methanol and water, and it's all related to uh, temperature and the boiling points of the components in the binary fluid. We know that water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. Uh, methanol boils off, I think it's around 70 degrees Celsius or something like that. So the long story short out of all the math that you're going to see here in the next couple of slides when we're dealing with the uh, the vapor pressures and the percentage of each component uh, in the mixture. The idea is, is that uh, you want to have your temperature set around the area of vaporization for the component that you're trying to collect. So if we know that water boils at 100 and methanol boils at 80, the closer we can keep that temperature to 80 or just above 80, where the methanol will evaporate but the water doesn't evaporate, we are more efficient at collecting that methanol. In order to increase the concentration of that methanol to the water, uh, we feed back a portion of the stuff that we condensed in the form of reflux and we run it back down the tower and we'll talk about the purpose of reflux and things as, as we go along. But then the, the couple of pages that we're looking at here, pages two and three and four, are basically just kind of mathematically showing us um, the ratio of the binary components in, in the column and what we're trying to achieve and relating that to the temperature. <clears throat> okay, we're looking at continuous distillation processes here, not a batch distillation process. So the stages throughout a distillation process do not actually reach equilibrium or theoretical equilibrium uh, like we've talked in the previous couple of of pages um, and and due to that we end up getting this multiple stage distillation or a distillation column with all these different trays and each tray has uh, its own uh, ratio in it and they uh, change as they go up with with the temperature and you'll see that there's always a differential temperature uh, between the bottom of the column and the top of the column and the idea is that we want to maintain uh, a differential temperature between each of these different trays so that we can get the the motion of the product going through the column and that's how distillation works so the more stages we have the more refined the product is going to be in the end okay distillation column uh, is built upon, uh, upon a bunch of these trays or stages and these trays are designed so that they maximize the interaction of the vapor moving up the column with the liquid flowing down. So the heat's coming from the bottom of the column, the boiler at the bottom of the column, and that heats up the liquids in the bottom trays, causes them to vaporize. The rising vapor in turn heats up the trays above it. And you'll see as the column uh, gets taller, the temperatures decrease uh, as we go higher. Uh, this is uh, part of a function of the heat coming up from the bottom and losing its heating value as it goes up, as well as the effects of reflux coming down uh, the column, which has the tendency to cool the trays from the top uh, towards the bottom. But we'll look at that in a little bit when we look at the reflux. So a typical tray will have uh, these bubble caps and a vapor space, and the vapor comes in through the bottom, percolates through the liquid, in the tray that is being fed down from the reflux in, in a downcomer is what it's called and that interaction between the vapor and the liquid is what heats it okay so we're looking at a basic distillation column in terms of its functional areas or component areas this is a very important slide for you guys to understand um, we want to have a really good basic understanding of the physical attributes uh, of a distillation process. So this particular slide right here, I would expect you to be able to identify uh, if given this without any labels, you should be able to uh, label this. The, the reboiler down here uh, in the bottoms area is called a stripping section. We have a feed area that comes in on a feed tray and this feed tray can be at any point in the column depending on uh, the objectives that we have. We have an accumulator, we have a condenser, 
We have overhead vapor coming off of it. We have a line that's external reflux, which as you can see here, once this vapor comes to the top of the column, goes through this condenser, which is cooled, that turns the vapor back into a liquid where it accumulates in the accumulator. So this is concentrated product. And at this point, we can either take it off as distillate product, or we can send some of it back into the column in uh, the form of reflux, which helps us cool our trays and maintain that differential. And the top part of that column here with the accumulator, the condenser, and the reflux section is called the rectifying section. So knowing how to uh, label this particular picture would be important. Okay, we get into a bunch of whole whole bunch of interesting engineering type of stuff here. Don't uh, don't break your brain cells on understanding the ins and outs of this stuff here in in great depth. We don't do any math related to this, but this is just kind of uh, showing you what is going on in a distillation column that's all up and running, and all the different variables that are monitored and set and controlled in order to operate uh, distillation column here. I'm not going to get too crazy with you guys uh, asking you any of these variables, uh, D and percent L, K, P and all of this stuff. Not really concerned uh, with the depth uh, of these variables. But again, understanding what we are controlling in the process, uh, steam flow in, bottoms flow out, distillate flow out, reflux flow in, temperature of the column, lever of, level of the column, flow of the feed, pressure of the column, flow of the cooling medium, level in the accumulator. All of these variables comprise the entire system, and we're just kind of going through the next couple of pages here, uh, demonstrating uh, the effects and the need for all of these different uh, components. Okay, so basically, long story short, to uh, distillation columns here is whatever comes in must go out in some type of a ratio. So we can put in our bottom product here, our unprocessed feed product comes in on a, on a tray somewhere here. We have a reboiler that's heating the bottom's product and somehow we're getting some ratio based on how much we're putting in versus how much heat we're putting in to how much we're getting out. So regardless of what we put in, we're putting in 100, uh, uh, 100 kilograms per hour of feed. We are between the distillate, the bottoms, and the reflux. Going to also get 100 kilograms uh, per minute coming out. And that can be represented mathematically here using this material balance math. But we're not uh, going to do any math on that. But this is the basic idea of how, how it works. Just like we had in uh, some of the other advanced process things here, there's uh, model predictive versions, and then there's ways that are uh, done through through testing. <clears throat> so long story short here, if we change the ratio between the bottom split here in, indicated by the bottoms divided by the feed and the top split, which is a distillate divided by the feed, this will affect the concentrations of the materials that are coming out. And again, no math here for you guys to do. This is just uh, a long way of providing you guys the mathematical proof of what exactly is happening inside that column. Down on the bottom of the slide here, we have an important note here that says increasing the heat input increases the rate at which distillate product can be removed. And that kind of summarizes what they're trying to mathematically prove to you here. And, and basically it is the amount of heat that is required to uh, get a certain mass of feed up to that temperature allows us to pull off more of that temperature. Uh, so if we increase the heat, we can increase the vaporization, we can thereby increase the amount of product or condensate that we can take off of the top. Reflux ratio is an important term that you're going to hear, or you would hear had you had you been writing the provincial exam. Reflux ratio is pretty important, but reflux ratio, by definition, is the ratio of the reflux flow 
to the distillate flow. So we remember looking at the diagram from a couple of pages ago, once the condensate comes out of the accumulator, we have a choice of sending it down the line as a, as a product or putting some of it back into the column as reflux. And that is what we're talking about here when we're talking about the reflux ratio. So it's a relative measure of heat removal. It's an essential variable that is used in setting the light key concentration in the distillate. So the light key concentration, again, is that uh, percentage of the whole feed rate that has evaporated. The light portion is what has evaporated, and the bottoms is the remainder. Okay, there's a couple of terms here, infinite ratio, which talks about the total reflux flow and the maximum heat re removal, and the zero ratio, which is zero reflux flow and the minimum heat removal. I'm not too concerned about that, but do understand the definition of reflux ratio. Uh, do understand that there, there's a formula here. And again, note at the bottom of the slide, an increase in the reflux ratio causes an increase in the concentration of the light key in the distillate and try to picture it as you've you've got a uh, you know a pot and you're boiling off the steam you've got a lid on the pot and that steam uh, comes out and you condense it and then you put it back into the pot so what you're doing is you're really enriching the quality of the product in the pot or making the product that's in that pot overall lighter than it initially was you're changing the concentration in it so as a result, it's taking less heat to evaporate it. We're not changing the heat. So as a result, what happens is more of that stuff will evaporate. So each time that happens, it becomes more and more concentrated in the light products that we're after. Next section here, learning objective, describe the control strategies used in the distillation process. And there's a lot of different strategies that are used for controlling the distillation process. Uh, again, not enough time for you guys to become experts in them, but we will touch on uh, the different methods of controlling distillation. And you should have a fairly general understanding of how each of them work and which is the preferred method. Okay, so when we look at a column, we looked at a bunch of variables a few slides ago. Uh, there are a lot of different things that come into play when we're trying to control a column. Uh, these include things like feed flow, feed tray location, column pressure, reflux temperature, distillation composition and flow rates, the bottoms composition and flow rates. All of these things are set values that we put into the operating parameters for a column. Uh, a lot of stuff to wrap your head around. Uh, again, not our job to really wrap our heads around how, how each of these uh, work and doing the math and figuring out how they work, but it is important for us to understand the different loops that are involved uh, in column control. Okay, first control method that we're gonna look at is called pressure control, and we'd use this method unless there are incondensable products in the feed okay a total condenser that condenses all the vapor is used in a pressure control model uh, and in order to control the pressure you would think that we just open a, a pressure valve but it's not that simple um, we know that we can control pressure by throttling a pressure control valve if we wanted to but there are also other ways to do it for example if i have a hot liquid uh, with a closed lid, we know that it's going to be uh, a certain pressure at a certain temperature. So if I cooled that same liquid, the pressure inside of it would also go down. So we need to consider things like that as, as we move forward. So there are dynamics that are a little bit outside the normal thinking. So we look at water throttling, overhead throttling, and a flooded condenser as three methods of pressure control. Okay, water throttling on page 15, uh, the basic, I guess, method, uh, and like the other PowerPoints here, we started with the basic one, and then we move on to an improved one, and then another improved one. So water throttling is uh, slow acting, and it works by manipulating the coolant in the condenser. So here we have the coolant running through this condenser right here. And essentially what this is doing is cooling 
the uh, condensate that's going into the accumulator that changes the temperature of the process uh, or the product in the accumulator. And if we're feeding it back in the form of reflux, the temperature of this will have an effect on the temperature of all the trays as it goes down. Water throttling is appropriate when a process is operated near design conditions most of the time. Second type, oh, and I guess let's just have a quick look here. Uh, by identifying these diagrams uh, to the type of uh, control that they're doing. So water throttling, for example, here, you can see that we have a control valve on a flow transmitter that is receiving its remote set point from this pressure transmitter. So by looking at this, you can go, okay, the signal is coming from here. We're controlling the pressure in the column by throttling the amount of cooling water that is going through the condenser. So identifying it by what's going on is something that you're going to want to be able to do. Second one here is overhead throttling. Uh, it's faster acting. It is working by manipulating the vapor flow on the top of the column. It's not as common uh, because of the large control valve requirement and that can cause fluctu uh, fluctuations in the pressure in the accumulator. So you'll see here it's uh, equipment wise um, adding in this control element here, throttling as it says, throttling the pressure as it comes out of the column. Again, as it says above here, causes pressure fr fluctuations in the condenser. So by looking at this, you can see that this is the component that will indicate overhead throttling. Third type here is flooded condenser. This is used when coolant flow is constant and cannot be manipulated. So uh, I don't know why they show that we have the ability to manipulate coolant flow, but let's say that we can't. This manipulates the flow out of the condenser which varies the tube's surface area and cooling avail availability here. So by having these coils inside the condenser exposed or not exposed allows them more surface area for the overhead vapors to condense. So if these tubes are more covered, they would have less cooling capabilities than they would have if they were less covered. So this is a flooded condenser style. And again, just being able to kind of uh, identify them based on these diagrams and knowing them by term, uh, flooded condenser, overhead throttling, water throttling. They're uniquely different if we look at the diagrams. You can see here this flooded condenser by putting the valve down here allows us to maintain or change the level in the condenser here. And that's the best way to identify this flooded condenser method of control. <clears throat> okay, these were all um, pressure control strategies. The next little section here is on product composition control strategies, and we get into some engineering type uh, stuff here, as I precluded earlier. Uh, when we're talking about modeling or energy balance or material balance, we've talked about this in different subjects. Um, but for product composition control, and probably more common because we are, after all, after a certain product usually, two methods are used, conventional energy balance and conventional material balance, and they're similar but different. Conventional energy balance sets the column heat or cooling directly, and terms that are associated with that are called heating control or reflux control. And then we have conventional material balance which sets the distillate or bottoms flow directly. So one of them is temperature based and one of them is flow based. Okay, the way to identify these as we go through the next couple of slides, and this is the hot tip here, is look for where the set point is as a general identification rule for which type of product composition control we're looking at. So let's see what that looks like. Okay, heating control. Where do we get our heat from? I guess is the first question to ask yourselves. Well, the heat comes from the steam boiler down here at the bottom, right? So operator adjusts the set point of flow controller three 
and temperature controller four is used to set the energy balance here. So here we have the temperature controller four. Here we have the flow controller three. Here's that set point that I was telling you to look for here. The set point is on the steam flow or the heat flow. So we can go back and we can say, okay, this sets the heating or cooling directly. So heating control. So conventional energy balance. Second one here, reflux control. The temperature uh, is set through TC3, wherever the hell that is, hiding down here somewhere. TC3 and flow controller four, which is our reflux controller. And again, looking for that set point on the reflux line tells us that this is reflux control. Second set here, distillate control, pretty straightforward. Operator adjusts a set point for the temperature controller three and flow controller five to set the material balance. Okay, so we're looking at the second set here, material balance, not energy balance. Okay, again, looking set point on the distillate line right here. So FC5 right there, our temperature controller is still TC3 over here. So again, to find them by name and diagram is more or less all we're after here. Last one, bottoms control. Set points is what we're looking for. There it is down here on the bottom, on the bottoms line. So set point for TC4 is also set, and in this case, FC6, the bottoms flow controller, is set for this material balance method. So those are the four different methods under the two different categories and how you can identify them. So you need to know uh, the two categories, energy balance and material balance, and then the two methods of control for each, and then to be able to identify them by drawing and practice. Okay, advanced control strategies for the next couple of slides here. Analyzer control, feed rate changes, and the combination of feed rate and composition changes. Okay, analyzer control. So this is uh, lab sampling. So this means that you're going to have to take a periodic sample to the lab in order to verify what is going on. So we're just kind of precluding to what happens when we put the analyzer in here, which is what really would happen in most uh, applications here. So in the basic version where we'd have to take a sample to the lab, it assumes the composition of distillate based on TT5. So TT5 is our temperature transmitter here, which is up at our top tray. Our top tray is gonna be closest to what we have for a product. So based on that, that temperature, and you'd have to know something about the, uh, the temperatures that are resultant to each uh, individual product. So the temperature of methanol or the temperature of propane or the temperature of ethanol or whatever it is. You'd need to know that. We don't get into it that deeply here. But let's say it was going for methanol. We'd want to have this set for, you know, somewhere around 70 or 80 degrees, whatever the temperature for methanol is. And then we'd assume that if this is at that temperature, most of the stuff coming off of it is going to be that product. We wouldn't know unless, of course, we took a sample to the lab. So that leads us to the second evolutionary step here is analyzer control using the analyzer. And you'll see that we had an analyzer in here, AT right here, which will help us throttle the amount of distillate. So if it's not what we want it to be, or if it is what we want it to be, this analyzer is going to tell us. If it comes through here and it says, oh, this isn't rich enough, this is not good, we can't, we can't pull this off of product, it's going to close the distillation valve a little bit, it's going to open the reflux valve a little bit, and it's going to run it through the process again until it becomes more concentrated. At that point, the distillate valve will open more, the reflux valve will close more, and we'll save some of our product. So that's the benefit of using the analyzer. Okay, feed rate changes here. Uh, this happens uh, regularly, right? We're talking about the rate of feed coming into the column. And mathematically, we can do this using a, a static 
a model saying, okay, well, if we got so many kilograms per hour coming in, we know that it takes so many BTUs per kilogram to heat it to a certain amount, so we can do mathematical calculations and we can develop a, a static model for this. But again, this is above our pay grade. Um, so we're not too concerned with it here, but um, we're going to look at feed rate changes and the effects of reflux flow. <clears throat> okay, using that analyzer here adjusts the distillate flow according to the feed uh, compensation using feed forward control. So you can see here all the dynamic things that are coming out of this uh, transmitter here. We're taking uh, an analyzer that's analyzing the composition of our feed product and the flow of our feed product and we're feeding that in as a remote set point into this flow computer here that is also taking data from the um, condensate analyzer and comparing that in order to control the amount of distillate that is going out. So comparing the feed rate and the composition changes and throttling the distillate valve again in order to maintain the amount of reflux that is going into the column in order to, to try to get us to that composition that we're after. And I know this is overwhelming and challenging to, to look at this, um, but we're just trying to illustrate the evolutionary um, control practices, I guess, as, as we go through here. So it's a little bit complicated here, but basically we're looking at what happens when the feed rate and composition changes, how, how can we control that? And, and we can't control that without putting a lot of control elements on it. And that's what we've got here. Okay, model predictive, um, we looked at doing it by testing, uh, and we also look at it but doing it model predictive. So model predictive here measures the disturbances with the flow transmitter uh, AT, or FT1, sorry, analyzer AT1, analyzer AT5, AT6, PT2, and FC2, and uses a process model to manipulate the boil up and reflux ratio in a timed way to minimize disturbances. So again, Next level stuff uh, for us to do, and I'm just mentioning this, I guess, just just for the sake of um, indicating this this model predictive portion of it here. Again, this is engineering and not really in our pay grade. Okay, multiple component separation we just touch on here um, very very briefly, um, and I threw this in here not because it's something that you need to learn necessarily, but because it relates to our, our column that we have at the college there. Uh, although we do only do binary distillation uh, in our lab, when you get out there and you look at the column, you'll see that on every tray, there is a, a tubing connection, a valve and a tubing connection where we could pull off individual com components off of each tray. And if we were doing that, it would we would call those fractions. Uh, and we call it fractionation, which is just a more complicated version of, of distillation. So when we take off multiple components like this, we call it fractionation, uh, and it's just a more complicated form of, of distillation. Okay, we can do it tray by tray, as we saw in the previous slide, or we can have a series of columns, as we have in the diagram here, set to different pressures and different temperatures. And as a result, we can get different products out of them as we go along. And many of you who have worked oil and gas may have seen a, a process train at work where you have uh, all these columns set up and they call them the deethanizer, the depropanizer, the debutanizer. I know out at Nova Chemicals, for example, this is a very, uh, very common process. And this is the way that they separate all the products that they um, get from the raw natural gas, the ethane, uh, which they use for their plastics, the propane and the butane, which they send back out to market as fuels and feeds for other uh, other areas here. So fractionating, taking it off tray by tray, or whether you do it in a series of columns with different settings, different means to the same end. Learning objective here, describe common problems associated with distillation control. And I'll give you guys a heads up. This is the probably the most important objective in the ILM here. Um, identifying causes 
and identifying what has happened in a uh, in a process that's been disturbed. Okay, so distillation column, column problems here will result when an operator makes an adjustment that's outside of the process's design limits. And that's kind of why we look at the design limits kind of a little bit in the background there. Um, mathematically, we don't know the details, um, but we will know for sure if an operator does something, uh, we can look at what has happened and hopefully be able to determine um, where the where the operators made a mistake. So these problems that we're going to try to identify include flooding, dry trays, and weeping, and you'll be expected to identify by description uh, each of these conditions. And you'll also be expected to identify a couple of feed component problems uh, that relate to the vapor distillate and feed that has entrained uh, gases or inert gases in it. So we'll look at uh, each of these individually here. Okay, flooding, the first problem that we have to look at uh, by definition is the excess accumulation of liquid inside the column. So it makes pretty much good sense with the name flooding means too much water and that's exactly what it means in the terms uh, related to distillation here. Why is it bad? Because excess liquid can block the vapor movement up the column and cause what is known as puking. How do we identify flooding? Flooding is identified through the measurement of differential pressure. Okay, there should be a differential pressure between uh, the columns. If it's flooded, the pressure, I believe, will go up compared to, uh, compared to here where there's no water, right? You're going to have one PSI here. If it perks through this water here, no problem. There will be a little bit of differential pressure. If I have one PSI here and I'm puking through the bubble caps and through this little bit of water, that's fine. I'll have the same pressure as I'd have here, but if I have a bunch of water on top of it, that's going to increase the pressure and create more differential pressure. So that's how we indicate or can determine if flooding has occurred. Dry trays, kind of the opposite of flooding here. They do not have enough liquid to work correctly. Uh, an increase in differential pressure and temperature indicates dry trays. And I may mess up my descriptions here uh, a little bit. Don't hold me against that here, but uh, do make sure that you understand uh, what causes or how we can determine what's going on based on uh, the process conditions. So decrease in differential pressure and temperature indicates dry trays and increase typically of differential pressure will indicate, indicate sorry, a flooded tray. Okay, weeping, the third term that we're going to look at here occurs when a liquid in the trays leak through vapor passages onto the tray below due to low vapor flow up the column. So if we look at this here, I've got my bubble caps. Um, let's look at the previous one here. I've got my bubble caps and they're normally working this way. The vapor comes up, perks its way through this little bit amount of water, goes up, makes it to the next tray and repeats itself. If it doesn't make it all the way through or there's too much water on top of it, that water will just puke back down or weep back down. This leads to dumping, uh, a term that describes uh, a situation where the liquid from all the trays cascades to back down to the base of the column. And if you hear, if you see a sharp differential pressure drop, that is what they use for an indication of weeping. So again, be able to identify uh, by definition these terms and the process characteristics that we look for in order to determine or identify what's going on inside the column. And if you play your cards right, you can uh, simulate all of these issues uh, in the distillation lab. <coughs> okay, vapor distillate, uh, pretty straightforward here. Vapor distillate is produced when the next process requires a vapor or the distillation equipment cannot liquefy all the components in the distillate. It'll use a partial condenser that ensures some liquid accumulation for reflux use. So again, a little bit of a twist here. Uh, we're taking vapor off of the distillate. Remember, we've already taken it through. It's coming off. It's been condensed through the condenser. So it is now, once it leaves the condenser, it's called distillate. 
the distillate hides in the accumulator and usually we'll send it off as a product or we'll send it in as reflux. Um, but in this case, we can use the vapor distillate here for something else also if we want. Just a point to mention. Okay, the, uh, sorry about that. Um, this is a problem, right? We don't, we don't want the vapor typically. We only want liquid usually coming off the bottom of the distillate tank. Okay, feed with inert gases. Uh, this is problematic for us. Feeds that contain inert gases that won't condense can cause a blockage in the vapor flow to the condenser. So it's at a different temperature. Inert gases uh, are far less volatile than usually the things that we find inside of a column. So it becomes a problem for us. Okay, to uh, help eliminate this process of having inert gases in our, in our feed, we use what's called a flooded condenser with a bypass, and this allows the inert gases to pass around. Uh, what else do I got to say here? Trying to make some sense here. There's the line that you see we've added this extra line in here. This is the bypass that allows the inert gases to go past. And you'll see here now these come into the top of the accumulator and they are taken off as an inert gas stream. Okay, flooded condensers condense more vapor when the level drops, uh, which drops the column pressure. I didn't put enough information there for me to talk about a little bit here. Um, but again, that has to do with the amount of exposed coils in the condenser here. So if this is flooded, there's less coils uh, available. If that level drops, you'll get more condensing going on. Long story short, page or the summary, distillation is a process that uses vaporization and condensation to separate a liquid mixture. The product compositions in a distillation process can be controlled using conventional energy balances, which involves heating control or reflux control, or conventional material balances, which involve distillate control or bottoms control, or the third method, advanced strategies using analyzer control, feedforward control, or model predictive. Problems include flooded trays, dry trays, and weeping. And these are a result of adjustments that are outside of the design limits or some operator touching things he shouldn't. And requirements for vapor distillate or feeds with inert gases may require partial condenser or a flooded condenser with a bypass. So again, this is mostly about describing the operational components and the strategies that we use to control distillation. There are, as far as I remember, no math questions for you guys to do in this ILM, but you, there is a lot of identifying um, and understanding the different types of control. So I hope this makes some light of all of the um, pages in the ILM. Again, read the process, try to wrap your head around the process, but remember, keep it fundamental. Don't overwhelm yourself with a lot of the engineering proof in there. Uh, be concerned with how the equipment that we deal with affects the distillation column and what we should know so that we can take care of that equipment. That's it for this uh, presentation, I believe. So I hope that works for you guys. This will cover all of the material required for APC exam number one, which you guys should write in the next day or two here. Uh, if you have any questions, email me. And uh, that's it. One thing. Um, Tyler, I noticed yeah. PLCs is Wednesday. Would it be possible okay. if everyone else is cool with it, if we like would move that to like Thursday or Friday? Why? It just seems like it's a lot to kind of go through in three days here. No, I don't think so. You finished the lecture on Friday. I know, but it's it's it just seems like so it's jam-packed. Three, three days, three so tests, I don't know. So you had Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and whatever day. And I spent, uh, we, we all spent a lot of time studying, I'm sure, but if we should do a democracy here. This isn't communist. 
The, well, no, this is this is not a this is not a democracy. And what day do I have it scheduled on? Wednesday. You got Monday. Wednesday. We have tests today, tomorrow, and Wednesday. So you got a protocols exam that you've studied all weekend for that you're probably going to write as soon as you get off this PowerPoint. Yes. And I got advanced <laughs> process tomorrow.